Hello everyone, Blender 3.5 is finally here. So as usual, we're gonna sit down and take a look through the feature release page to take a look at what's available. So Blender 3.5, better in every way. There are quite a few interesting features in this version. One of the main categories of features the developers really wanted to push in this was the new hair system and hair tools. So there's gonna be quite a lot of that in this video, but there are some other really exciting features as well. For example, like the viewport compositor. Oh, that's pretty good. Vector displacement maps for sculpting. That's also pretty interesting. But before we get into it, you can see the lovely new splash screen here for the software. This one's contributed by Nicole Marina, who I believe did a talk at the Blender conference as well. So that might be an interesting watch if you're interested in her style of artwork. I think by the time I got to that talk, there were no seats available. So I think me and Pierrick were just like poking our heads in the side. Anyway, Blender Foundation and the online developers community proudly present Blender 3.5, featuring a viewport compositor, vector displacement sculpting, built-in hair assets, many light sampling for cycles, and so much more. Now in an act that might annoy some of the developers, we're actually going to skip over the hair notes for now and do this slightly out of order because it's a really big section, we'll come back to it at the end. So, vector displacement maps. Support for vector displacement maps, VDM brushes, has been added to the draw brush in sculpt mode. So if you don't know what vector displacement maps are, in regards to sculpting, they're an incredibly powerful tool. In regular displacement, you can only really move vertices in one direction, usually like along the normal axis. What this means for sculpting is uh, traditionally you'd be limited to only being able to use brushes that could displace vertices in one direction. Now that's not very useful for like complex sculpt objects, for example, ears on the side of a head because obviously there's a lot of like concave meshing that goes on there. Vector displacement maps are like an advanced form of height map almost that allows you to get these multi-directional meshes creating overhangs over other parts of the mesh. This is extremely useful for speeding up your sculpting workflow as you can see in this video because it allows you to just instantly draw on complex meshes with overhangs and then seamlessly go straight back into your regular sculpting toolset. This type of map provide an easy way to create complex shapes that can have overhangs in one Brush dab. Dab. Okay, I won't do that. For the best results, VDM textures should be in the open EXR format with color clamping disabled. So you can download the demo file if you want to give that a try. And there's also a manual section here in the documentation to explain it a bit more. As for baking VDMs inside of Blender, I don't think you can do it, but there's a demo file available somewhere on a dev page, which has like a plain setup, which lets you bake it. I need to double check that info. Anyway, this next feature is something I know a lot of people have been looking forward to. So the compositor, what you comp is what you get. A new GP based compositor backend takes the 3D viewport to the next level. You'll never see the viewport the same. So this is essentially the real-time compositor, letting you modify how the scene looks, like the scene result, the real-time render visual, before you've actually rendered out a frame. So you can make stylistic corrections, changes, do all of your visual experimentation with the compositor in real time. And as you can see here in this little demo video, um, when you're outside of the camera view, the compositing isn't applied unless you go to the drop down and then you can choose the compositor to be active always and then no matter where you're looking around the scene you will always get those composition effects so that's something i really want to play around with let's read a bit more about that a viewport experience never seen before overlays are drawn on top of your compositing result allowing you to see and interact with your mesh and other objects this is fantastic so as you can see the overlays for your meshes and your objects are always active after the fact so you can still see exactly where they are and make changes to your scene even though the effects are still being applied when you look at things like this i just think blender's made so many strides in terms of like the user interface experience since 2.79 over oh, the dark ages. Okay, so the important caveat here, note this is considered the first milestone of a large project. View layer passes and some nodes are not supported yet. Further work is planned for future releases. You can of course click to see the list of supported features and there'll be some information here by Omar kind of explaining what is and what is not yet available. It's really nice of them to keep this updated. Okay, so for Mac OS users, which I'm not sure how many of you use Mac, but from my um, product sales, I've gotten an estimation that about 10% of people are on Mac, but I'm not sure if that like lines up with the larger community. On Mac OS, the 3D viewport now makes native use of metal, leading to massive performance improvements for animation playback and EV rendering. Wonderful, like who doesn't want more performance? This is never a bad thing. EV real-time interactive viewport performance, we can see the metal versus OpenGL comparison. Bit of a confusing color scheme going on here with the graph. Scene export, shaders, pre-compiled. Basically, things are faster on Mac. So for cycles, there's a new feature to help the 
sampling when there are many lights active. So Cycles can now use a light tree to more effectively sample scenes with many lights, get nicer results faster. We can see the comparison here with the light tree off versus light tree on. Obviously the accuracy is much better, especially around the center point here. We can see all the bounce lighting giving the uh, sampling a hard time. Both renders took the same amount of time. With the light tree turned on, the noise is significantly reduced at the cost of a somewhat longer render time per sample. So that's the trade-off. The samples take a bit longer to generate, but the results are more accurate. Light tree works best in scenes with physically correct lighting, avoid custom falloff or ray visibility tricks. These may interfere with the heuristics used in the light tree. Tweak it, the multiple important sample toggle in materials has been replaced with a new emission sampling setting. By default, it's set to auto. For single-sided emitters or closed meshes, setting this to front can help reduce noise. Nicer than to provide some advice here for optimizing the rendering in the scene. Different results, it's most likely caused by light clamping. Clamping is a biased method that depends on the sampling strategy. Generally, if the light tree works well, there will be less clamping and the render will be closer to the unbiased result. So of course you can click through and read more about that. I do appreciate that they try to make as many documentation pages as they can. Documentation is a very boring thing to write, so well done to the dev team for keeping on top of that. There's another example here on the documentation page. We can see a scene without light tree. It's quite noisy, especially at the back here. And with light tree, there's a slight improvement. So flexible spotlights. Spotlights now support non-uniform object scale. Interesting. Matching how Eevee renders them as well. Okay, that's nice. So it's more cohesive between the rendering engines. All right, so spotlights have got some love. What about area lights? Area spread. The spread property in Cycles area lights mimics a gridded softbox in real life, but it could be noisy to render when the area light was disc or ellipse shaped. In Blender 3.5, the result is significantly less noisy, smooth renders no matter the shape. Okay, let's check this out. So we have a disc shaped area light before and after. There we go, that's much better. You can see the consistency there. As someone who loves area lights, it's nice to see them getting some love again. These are the things I really appreciate in Blender. I know like all the new features are really fancy, but just improvements to the core feature set is something I really appreciate. Because again, new features are really exciting, but when there are improvements to like the foundation of stuff we've been using forever, it means that if you go back to old files, you should see improvements like in accuracy, in performance, etc. Additionally, the anisotropic BSDF with Beckman roughness using isotropic sampling has been improved. You can see a comparison of that here. For someone new to 3D graphics, that sentence is a proper tongue twister. But I mean, in addition to that, OSL support with optics on the GPU, improved adaptive sampling for overexposed scenes. That's probably quite good for those of us that like to use too many lights. So for animation, extreme poses, the pose library got improved with new options and shortcuts to speed up your workflow. While blending a pose, hold control to flip the pose, press E to exaggerate, so you can go beyond 100% of the pose. That's quite dangerous. Reminds me of those game mods where people like exaggerate the animations. So you end up with like all this funny like facial stuff going on. Drag to the left to subtract a pose. So basically there's just more complex methods for blending between poses for your characters. And this one is cool, easy easing. The new ease operator in the graph editor helps you align keys on an exponential curve, which is useful for quickly making an easing transition on multiple keys. I really like this one because I think I've wanted that in the past, but can never really figure out how to do it properly. And there's more animation stuff to so improve to propagate pose operator, new select linked vertices in weight paint mode. You can pin dope cheat channels, subframe jumping to next slash previous keyframes, fixed invert vertex group toggle in the armature modifier, motion paths can be set to update a custom range, add F curve modifiers to multiple channels at once, and pre 3.0 pose library system has been sunsetted. So for Grease Pencil, for our 2 and 2.5D artists out there, Natural Beauty, the new natural drawing speed timing mode in the build modifier replays strokes using the speed of the stylus when it was performed, giving it a more natural feel. That's very cool for people that are going to be making animations with this because as you can see the smiley face is drawn, build modifier, natural speed, and it plays back at the same speed. That's a very cool effect. Once again, documentation here to learn more about the modifier and more grease pencil features. So sculpt auto masking has been moved to global setting, offset modifier improvements, new auto masking pie menu. Very nice. Copy and paste now works in multi-frame mode, vertex opacity available under overlays in sculpt mode, interpolate sequence operator improvements, new option to show the brush size in draw tool cursor, fixed radial control display size, new layer menu, Y now highlights the name field, Material popover now displays fill color for fill materials. Again, I'm impressed with like how so many areas of Blender are getting even just these small improvements with like every update. Always great to see, especially when you compare it to uh, some other 3D software out there. So USD, compress to impress. Blender 3.5 adds support for importing and exporting USDZ files. A USDZ file is a zip archive that can contain images, audio, and other USD files for convenient sharing. So this is all about interoperability between software, being able to make sure that everything 
everything is packaged up and available to wherever you're sending it to. So again, we can take a look at the uh, documentation. This is under the pipeline assets and input output section. Ooh, hold on. The new all asset library displays content from all other asset libraries. <gasps> That's good. I like that. New essentials asset library containing a number of assets that are now shipped with Blender. So this is where we're going to get onto the hair stuff. Okay, that's exciting. Let's let's go back to the plan. So more USD stuff, support importing USD shapes, USD export changes to pass USD checker, add scale and bias for exported USD preview surface normal maps, convert USD camera properties to MM from USD units, and author extents on exported USD geom mesh. Okay, industry ready. Blender 3.5 is fully aligned with the VFX reference platform 2023, making it easier to integrate into studio pipelines. So this is one of the things that people have been complaining about Blender, just making sure that everything is up to using the same kind of standard so that people have confidence using Blender in different pipelines in different industries, particularly in this case of VFX. But wait, there's more. Okay, so here's all the other like small stuff. But of course, like I said, we were to go back up to the top to take a look at the hair content coming in Blender 3.5. So they've got a video at the top here with Simon Thomas explaining the hair nodes and giving visual demonstrations. Uh, so that's definitely worth a watch. The hair tools are interesting because they're kind of not just tools, they're brushes, but they're also geometry nodes. They've gone with a really interesting approach, which I actually really like, which is using geometry nodes for tools development. And basically in a modular way, almost you can layer up these different geometry nodes, hair brushes to create complex patterns. I think it's a really smart idea. So you can see that here in the chapter modular building blocks, they kind of outline that general design philosophy. Then run through the categories. I really like the icon design for these as well. It really goes to show like the flow of how those tools affect the hair. So whoever came up with those designs, well done. I like them. That explain how to use the assets and because, you know, geometry nodes can be easily parameterized. Parameter parameterized? It's parametric. You can have procedural control over the results with exposed values in the modifier stack. Okay, so let's take a look. Creating and grooming fancy hairdos is easier than ever. And you can download the hairstyles demo file. That'll be good if you want to play around and get familiar with the this new type of tool in Blender. Here we can see a demonstration of kind of redirecting these guide hairs to produce complex results. Any kind of hair, fur or grass is possible, powered by the flexibility of geometry nodes. With great power comes great complexibility. Very nice. So Blender now includes hair assets to make your life easier. And again, wow, so many demo files. Like this is one of the things I keep saying that I love about like every update. They just give everything to you. If you want to learn more about making animal hair with this technique, then there's a demo file for it. Go ahead, play around. Power Within. For the first time ever, Blender ships with built-in assets. The Essentials Asset Library comes with 26 hair assets split into categories Deformation, Generation, Guides, Utility, Read and Write. Simply drag and drop from the asset browser onto your setups. But what can they do? A video and link to the menu was worth a thousand words. So you have different node tools to create and modify the hair in different ways. So you can generate your hair along a surface. You can interpolate the hair, which interpolates the existing guide curves. You can duplicate the hair curves to give yourself more attach hair to a surface so you can make it connect to a surface and align it to the surface normal. You can clump the hair curves. This is a really cool effect because of just being sticking all out individually, you can, well, as you can see here, kind of start grouping them together, makes it much more natural. You can curl the hair curves. So this deforms existing hair curves into curls using guide curves. You can braid hair curves. This is where things are getting more complex. Deform the hair curves into braids using the guide curves. You can frizz the hairs to make them more scruffy. Alternatively, you can smooth them out as well. You can roll them over like they've been curled and much more. You've got all these different tools you can play with for the hair curves. They've done a really good job with this. We can click to see all the hair nodes again, documentation. So of course there's more in regards to nodes and physics. So I'll try and say this quickly. New image info node, new image input node, new blur attribute node, store named attribute node can now store 2D vector attributes, new mirror extension type for image texture, field utility nodes have been renamed, improved modifier user interface, new move to nodes operator, drag and drop node group assets in the viewport, New interpolate curves node, trim curves now have selection input, faster procedural changes, hold alt to disable automatically attaching nodes. Oh wow, finally? Hold on, sorry this one just caught my attention. Allow skipping the automatic insertion of nodes on top of links. This is actually one of the things I've hated about Blender. I don't really like that automatic like node linking thing when I'm just trying to move nodes around in a tree. Sorry, let's continue. New edges to face groups node. UV map output in mesh primitive nodes. Split edges is now over two times faster. Faster display of many geometries instances. That'll probably be useful for me. Improved context menu in node editor. Copy and paste nodes at mouse position. That's cool because before they would just be pasted wherever they were in the tree. So if you're you know designing node trees and node groups, sometimes when 
when you paste a node, it would be like way off in the distance somewhere. So that's quite handy. Reorganize geometry nodes, add menu, hold alt to swap node links while connecting them, and 25% faster cloth simulation using self collision. How much stuff do they pack in? <laughs> it's great. I love the momentum. So there is a lot for you to explore. I think the things I'm going to have fun with are exploring these new geometry nodes tools. I like the idea of the new asset library for seeing everything at once. The real time compositor is something I'm definitely going to play with. The vector displacement maps kind of opens the way for new products as well to give people like good starting points when it comes to like sculpting things. As usual, I'll need to go and double check the Python API changes to see which of my add-ons have broken, but usually it's not that bad. So yeah, lots to check out. Before we close this up, there are a couple of like news pieces from our affiliate partners that I just want to let you know about. So first of all, to animate a group of mentors who have a lot of experience in digital animation have finally released their comprehensive animation course for Blender featuring 70 video lessons, 15 assignments, quality character rigs, PDF handbooks of each lesson, as well as technical support. So it is quite an expensive course. I believe it's about $395 and that's before, you know, VAT. So it is a big investment and I would only really recommend it if you're like definitely really interested in becoming an animator. So if you're interested in updates, I believe you can also like put your email down on the website. But um, yeah, so I'll leave an affiliate link to this down in the description if you're interested in kind of checking out this course. And also from our partners over at CG Boost, Zacharias Reinhardt has been doing a lot of work on his uh, master sculpting in Blender course has just added a new animation chapter. So after doing the entire course teaching you how to use the sculpting tools in Blender and even how to create a creature, then how to rig a creature, they're now showing you how to animate one as well. So I think that's a pretty good extension to their course, which is, might I say, mighty comprehensive. There's a lot of content in this sculpting course. Well done, Zach. And it is $79 plus tax. As you can see, the prices for CG Boost courses are very reasonable, and I've recommended them a lot over the years. I still think they're producing some of the nicest and kind of well-rounded Blender course content. So I'll leave my affiliate link in the description for that as well. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this video. As you can see, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming in Blender 3.5. Well, I say it's coming, it's here now. You can go and download it. Hopefully you're going to be using the software to make some fun and cool projects. And if you do work on anything interesting, then let me know, because again, I'm always looking for stuff to put in my community roundup videos. No guarantees, but I might be splitting the series off to do other offshoots. So for example, community roundups, community product compilations, and community short film roundups, maybe. This kind of ties into our Blendstream website project, trying to find ways to like give more purpose to the review process to kind of speed that up in a cyclic way. We'll get to that anyway. If you enjoy my content, maybe check out some of my products on codisol.online slash store. I make Blender add-ons, both free and paid, to help you speed up your workflows. You're probably going to find something interesting on there. And you can also sign up to my Patreon to not only support all of our work, but to also get your name put on this Hall of Patrons artwork, which I do need to update. And of course, if you made it to the end of this video, consider putting a cake emoji in the comments. If you do this, it will show me who actually made it this far. And I always enjoy seeing those comments because I love seeing the familiar faces. So yeah, stay safe, everyone. Have a great day and I will see you next time.